And thank you once again for tuning in to this podcast series of Business Talk. I am your host, Katrina, and this is The Edge. Today's Business Talk is a conversation, and it goes beyond the numbers, beyond the reports. In this episode, I attempt to uncover the basis for why particular indicators are used in determining the overall performance of our U.S. economy. And if you're like me, then I'm sure you've wondered why some reports always get pumped up and highlighted all over the media when it comes to determining our performance. Today, I am joined with a special guest, so let's jump right on in and get this conversation started. So more often than not, we hear chief economists discuss these common categories, if you will, and they all factor in determining how successful we are. Most common indicators we hear are employment numbers for growth, job growth. We hear retail sales. We hear auto sales and home sales. Why do you think that is? Can you share with us your thoughts and insights? So some of these um, indexes are used to measure the uh, economic growth uh, because they're common uh, all around and there may not be the best benchmarks or indexes to be using. However, um, to keep it all relative and be comparable to history, uh, these have always been used. Uh, Are they the best? Uh, Not really because everything could be subjective. Uh, the employment, uh, as we look at employment, I think as we know it for the past few years, over the past eight years or longer, we can look at employment, but is that the best uh, benchmark to use when we know that employment has continued to increase, but it has not increased in the best areas. You know, full, full-time employment is not growing. Part-time employment may be growing. or um, so let me let me just jump in there. Let me ask you a little bit more about that. So why do they use employment and why is job growth um, always you know highlighted in every you know economic article? Uh, whenever looking at reports and indexes, this seems to be the number one driver, even in the news today, job growth and employment. Can you just share from your own you know your own experience, your own insights? Why do you think that plays such a major role in, in this whole um, totality of you know, our economic performance? It is viewed due to the fact that the more people you have employed, it could be seen that the economy is doing better. Um, the less you have in unemployment, it means that the economy is doing well, people are working, people are making money, they're spending money, and um, it, it's a, um, an index that can tell you, well, out of the population, um, is is there enough jobs for ever, to go around for everyone? Mm-hmm. Now, the higher the unemployment, the worse it is, because, you know, historically, that means that we have gone through a recession or mm. depression. That means that no one's working. There's no spending that they are able to do. They are not able to uh, maintain their own households. Mm-hmm. The lower the unemployment means that they are able to maintain their households. They're spending money growing the economy. Okay. No, that makes more sense. And I don't want to go too deep into this um, concept related to employment and job growth, but I do think it's important to at least... Um, give it an honorable mention. A lot of the job growth that we are seeing um, over this last probably decade, <clears throat> especially the last you know five years or so, have really been minimal job growth. And what we've seen is like a shift from a lot of the full-time employment opportunities shifting into more, you know, part-time opportunities and a lot of the people who were employed full-time who are no longer employed at that position or that role in that company, they may still technically be out of the workforce and maybe not all, but 
I would say a significant portion and other portions of that category or even other individuals, they may be taking on, you know, two and three part-time jobs just to kind of make ends meet. What do you think about that? And that's true. I think uh, the unemployment is the incorrect measurement for right now because the type of um, jobs that people are finding out there or they're, they're getting our part-time jobs. That's where the growth has been. It has not been full time. Mm -hmm. And you're correct. Some individuals are having to have two or three jobs just to make the income that they were just to sustain their household. Right. Do you think also that <clears throat> the the graduates who are, you know, completing their four year education or degree, do you think they're also having a hard time still finding um, decent, respectable jobs that are related to what they went to school for? What do you see in the marketplace? I think that it, it has improved here lately. I think in the past, uh, we knew that a lot of uh, individuals who were uh, just coming out of uh, school had graduated they were having to go back and live with their parents and that's still the case now many of them are still going back work you know living with their parents however they are beginning to find those jobs that uh, you know companies are hiring and that has that has increased based on the growth the economy has had in the past couple of years mm -hmm. and especially with the new administration improving that uh, however you still have a lot of these uh, kids who are well educated still living with their parents okay yeah all right well thank you for adding your insight there let's move on to retail sales as an indicator um in that category itself is retail sales along with consumer spend behavior can you tell me a little bit about what your thoughts are and how that's how that's an important, I guess, category or index that's measured when it comes to looking at the entire, you know, U.S. economy as a whole. The retail um, sales are viewed uh, due to the fact that if individuals are working, they're going to spend money. Okay. So you look at the sales. If if people are out there making, generating income, mm -hmm. are, are they going out there spending that money? on items that whenever things are tight, they probably would hold off and use whatever they have to last them longer instead of going out there and spending money and buying new items. So in the past, it has always been used. Is it the best index? I would disagree mm -hmm. because I think so, some of that is subjective and not always it's not a great benchmark to say we're having a great economy. You're right. No, that makes sense. Um, so it's just really been one of these main buckets that we use to determine if our economy or how our economy is performing. You mentioned it being subjective and I have to agree with you there for sure because just because I'm spending at the store doesn't mean that my overall financial condition is indicative of that behavior. And I think that that's probably the case across the, across the board. What do you think? I agree. Uh, I think that um, people are out there spending or they're buying items that they need or want. Uh, I think it depends on the individual. Uh, majority of it, a lot of people are buying items that they probably held off for a long time and now they, it's a necessity that they must uh, go ahead and replace some of the items. But at the same time, if you're going to look at retail sales, you have to start paying attention as to how are these sales being done? Are individuals maxing out their credit cards or they're using their cash from the income that they're, from their, um, that they're generating from their own jobs? As we can see, uh, credit card debt has increased over the past few years, over the past decade. And if that continues to be the, you know, the way that individuals are doing it, we could see a bubble growing within that um, industry of the credit cards. Right. And again, the focus of this, you know, 
discussion and conversation is really just to have a discussion on why they use these indicators you know, to measure the economic performance. All right, so the next category that we often see is auto sales. Um, can you talk a little bit about why that would be you know, an important index to use for the, um, the economic performance? So for auto sales, um, it is used uh, due to the fact that in a good economy, individuals can go out there, replace their vehicles every um, anywhere between three to five years. You don't keep your cars too long, you go out there, get you a new car. You're not maintaining any older cars. In a slower economy, you keep your cars longer because you don't want to have so much debt. You pay them off, you keep it, you maintain it, and you want to have those vehicles last you much longer. Uh, and that's because you're being more conscious about your income. Okay. And you're trying to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the reason why you always have to look at a how were car sales uh, for the past quarter, past month, depending on um, when you're looking at it. They're important because you could kind of see the trends of what people are doing out there, same as retail sales. Again, those are just... Uh, the consumer behaviors. Ex exactly. Okay. And the more they're spending, the more uh, you know. You think that there's a lot more income that they're having, that mm -hmm. they're willing to spend it, splurge right. on themselves. Right. Versus in a bad economy, they won't. Right. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So, again, it kind of dovetails with the the retail sales on you know with auto sales, really going back to consumer spending and consumer behavior behaviors. Um, before I jump into the other category, I think it's important to at least use our common sense here and just really question that exact statement. So if I'm spending more money, but I'm using my credit card, if I'm upgrading my vehicle, that doesn't necessarily mean that I have a vehicle that's free and clear with no debt. I may just be adding more debt, right, to a loan or an existing loan. Sure, I'm sure that if there's the the finance sector that's probably also being taken into account in there, how many new vehicles are being financed per year um, nationally. Every new loan that gets booked as soon as a new loan, it doesn't necessarily mean that the old loan was paid off, it just means that the amount of the loan is probably number one increasing, so debt is really increasing. Um, not really indicative of a booming economy or even a prosperous economy, let alone a way to gauge where we are as a as an economy, you know, given our performance. So I kind of feel these metrics don't really serve as a true, I guess, representation of where we really are. What do you think about that? I do agree. I think that um, if you're going to use these indexes to kind of look at the growth of the economy, then you kind of have to bring other factors into in, into scope. And you're right, you have to look at um, debt financing, you know, how much of this, uh, how, how are they paying for these new items, you know, are they just um, increasing the amount of debt they have and what would be their uh, debt to income that they're now running in uh, and can they really afford it? Um, so th the index may, may may not be the best indicator. Mm -hmm. However, in historically, again, they are used just as a general benchmark okay. because um, you have to you have to look at something in order to determine the growth of the economy. And these are general items that are are general to the population of the, of of the country right. itself. Right. So that you know, uh, you can get into more details behind it. Right. However, uh, if you really want to be good at determining, okay, well, is this good growth or not? 
you have to look at these indexes and more along with it, ask the right questions and, and really dig into it to know, okay, well, what's really happening? Right, no, that makes sense and I agree with that. Thank you for adding your insight there. One last thing about this auto sales, it's not directly related, but it's definitely correlated here. Now then, this is truly my opinion, my perspective, but I'm sure that we can all agree that the, the that we've seen an inflation when it comes to what a car costs, even from your most basic four-door sedan um, economy car to even like a basic level SUV. I know that in my experience, which has been recently here, it surprised me just to see the cost these days of what these dealerships or the manufacturers are, you know, are pricing. You know, I'm very surprised to see that there's not really been much market pushback and how they're able to really kind of get away with such an increase or a spike in how much it costs to buy a modern day economy affordable vehicle. What do you think about that? Um, yes, uh, if it comes down to price, the cost of having a new vehicle, um, buying a new vehicle mm -hmm. today compared to 10 years ago, yes, the cost has increased or the value has increased the cost so what you're going to be right. paying for it. Why is that? Well, one is just want to note it is inflation. Mm -hmm. You know, inflation is going to happen, and yes, the cost is going to be higher than what you were paying ten years ago. The main reason why it's more expensive now, you have to be reasonable, is what's going into these vehicles. If even in your very basic car now, a person wants to have a Bluetooth. Uh, radio okay. uh something that they can connect their iphones or you know androids in mm -hmm. that's uh you know it's going to become com compatible with it right they want to have you no longer see an entry-level vehicle have a roll down window right it has to have uh, power. an automatic power locks right all that has a cost mm -hmm. in the past you would be able to get away with uh, rolling down your window not anymore individuals expect more out of what they're buying however does not mean that these companies are able to justify their cause of making the car for less because they are adding additional items to these cars to kind of meet the needs of what the individuals really want nowadays i see what you're saying and i agree with you to a point but i have to um rebuttal just some common sense things here. Don't you think a lot of these car manufacturers, and we don't have to name any names, but just the main um, household brands uh, that we're all familiar with, don't you think that by now, as evolved as, as evolved as we become, right, especially given the technology, the efficiency of machines, um, the factory warehouses, and all the capabilities, right, that we've seen and we know is already taking place today. Tell me, what is your opinion? I know you don't speak for them, but how is it possible that they haven't been able to overcome providing those those new, what we call basic entry, like automatic, you know, uh, windows, etc. How is it that we haven't already been able to evolve to where that is standard and basic and not at the cost of the consumer? Well, I think- but Do you understand the question though? I, I do. And I'm going to sort of say that some of those items are now becoming more of standard items out there. Now the cost, it doesn't matter what industry we look at. Mm -hmm any expense that any company has in order to generate a product is going to be put back into the consumers and you know they're going they're going to be the ones that are going to be paying for it because these companies that are publicly traded 
they have their own responsibility to generate higher income for their shareholders. Okay. So to them, it's okay, well, they're keeping up with the market and what is being requested now. However, if the request is for more, then they have to increase their the, the value of that car in order to put every single widget to be available in there, even if it's something that is now more standard. So then it would still make more sense to increase the the value, sure, but not increase the cost. Why would they increase the cost if it is not really costing them as a manufacturer with all the technology and the advancements and the upgrades into their own equipment machinery in their factory warehouse? It doesn't make any sense they would pass an invisible cost to the consumer just because they want to. And again, I think that uh, the justification behind that one is just going to be the inflation. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to leave a vehicle at a lower price when they know that they could pro possibly get away with increasing the cost or, the, you know, how much it's going to cost you to buy that vehicle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like I said, it wasn't exactly um, a direct, but it was definitely something that has been in my curiosity and I'm glad that we got to at least. Stands out. <laughs> yeah, it definitely stands out. I feel that um, that, you know, small dialogue was enough in itself for the listeners. Okay, now let's get to the, the home sales. So home sales is another category um, that is used as an index or a benchmark to determine how the economy is performing. Can you talk a little bit about why that would be? Um, what's significant about home sales being this category that's being measured? Um, I know we mentioned uh, before we began uh, about the increase in population, but can you tell me a little bit about what are your thoughts on this category? So home sales is used as a benchmark to kind of see, okay, it, uh, it's really based on the population growth and also to determine, okay, where is the population really moving to? Where is it growing? Is it something that continues to go? Because as, again, this uh, category here, this index along with vehicle sales and retail, mm -hmm. all falls back into unemployment. Is unemployment, you know, decreasing, meaning that there's more people working, which means that they're generating enough income to have a family and go out there and look for homes. Um, the index for home sales is more important for states and cities to determine, okay, which cities are growing the most okay. and why, you know, where, where are these people coming from? Where are they moving to? And not only that, you're really looking at how many new home, uh, new homes are they creating out there? And is it enough to, justify their population growth. Okay. So state by state, they're all reporting in or sending in their numbers um, to indicate how many home sales they had per year, right? That should hopefully indicate um, how many families, because typically they're mm -hmm. single family homes for the most part, not always, but in this case, how many families are moving into the into the state, and um, that kind of helps them determine the increase in population, city by city, and probably gives them some demographic information as well. Correct. Okay. And you have to take into account also the population of why the uh, home sales are important is because you have to do, look at okay. What is the population growth based on the number of uh, citizens that the country may have? And every day you have, you know, new individuals that are born, mm -hmm. and there, and then you have the aging population, but all of them have a home; they mm -hmm. don't have to pay for it. And then you have new entries that are coming in; they're probably entering the. Uh, you know, the employment sector, and now they go and create their own families. Right, right. So there's growth in so many ways that that's what pushes the home sales. Okay. You want to look at home sales as well as the 
number of individuals that are choosing to not buy a home anymore mm-hmm. and actually going to mm-hmm. rent. Okay. So then you go, you will be uh, looking into the um, rental sector, you know, apartment leasing, mm-hmm. and see, okay, well, how many of them are choosing to uh, lease? Right. And, and it, what you will notice is that many of the older generations, um, they have... They chose to buy homes. The new generations, the millennials, they're deciding to lease nowadays. Okay. So, you know, that also plays a factor into your home sales. Right. And it's just that a lot of people, a lot of cities are heavily populated, overbuilt at, at some point. And all these, uh, many of the millennials are choosing to be closer in town because they want to take... Um, they want, they want to be able to use all the amenities that the city provides. And that's how the cities are beginning to, you know, evolve and provide more of these um, items to these individuals. But again, home sales is another index that, that has to be looked at because it is important for cities and states, not so much in the, um, in, in the country. Right. Um. I wanted your opinion here. Um, what do you think the the average demographic is for new home purchases just right now? I know this is just your opinion, but would you, how would you describe that individual? I'm not referring to ethnicity or gender. I'm just referring to age. You would see the individuals are uh, buying more homes age-wise. They're going to be in their mid-30s um, or older. Okay. And that's just because they probably, uh, in their minds, they're settling down. They already have a good job that's paying them well. Mm-hmm. They are probably uh, having a family. And they are beginning to what we would, you know, what would be classified in the past as living the American dream. Um, is that saying still true, holding true? It depends on who you ask, but that's the best way to describe it for now. Okay. And, uh, but normally that's when you begin uh, settling down, you get married, you start having kids, you probably move it out into the suburbs. Um but again, some of the new generations, we will see that that will shift, mm-hmm. and it will stay more in the, um, in the within the city uh, city lines. Right. And so, would you think it's fair to say that when looking at new home sales, right, across the United States, would you say that majority is the thirty to forty, or would you say majority would be 40 to 50 maybe in their second home or possibly you know third home that they're moving into either and that can be whether they're upgrading or downgrading or downsizing whichever may be the case i'm really looking to see what do you think um the age demographic is that's driving the home the actual home sales i don't know these the statistics between the two but if you ask me just my opinion Mm -hmm. i would have to uh, lead more as the 40 or 50 they're buying homes okay um i I think that's a generation that still wants to own a home still sees the real estate as a uh as part of something that they want to hold an asset for and and they're thinking about it in a different way compared to a younger uh someone younger than what who they are but uh again uh mindsets are shifting and people are beginning to look at home ownership as um differently right it's an expense of its own and you know uh people are choosing to lease right and, no. uh, to a point but again we this index uh, may not be one of the best indexes to follow to say okay what is our economic economic growth um we can look at the amount of permits you know if you want to look at real estate 
let's look at the amount of permits that the cities are issuing for new construction. Then look at the type of construction that's being built. But home sales may be an index that um, may not hold as much water mm -hmm. for you to really look at so much because I think it's very, um, it's not indicative to what's really happening. Right. No, thank you for providing that insight. And um, I'm following right with you on that construction piece, but that's a different topic for a different discussion. I want to still stay focused here. So just to um, bring some context here with the home sales and given that we may think that majority of the home sales are being purchased by an age demographic that is somewhere between 40s, 50s, possibly even 60s, more, more than likely not their first home, possibly their second or third, and either they're upgrading or they're downsizing, whichever is the case. When we look at the home sales, more often than not, they are, there's new home mortgages that are being originated, right? The government is, again, using this just like they use the auto sales and the new booked auto loans to determine the positive or the growth performance of our economy. I see the same, I guess, I see the same correlation happening with home sales too. Would you agree with that? Yes, I will agree. I think um, they're very related. I think all four indexes that we have been um, talking about all have about the same relation. And maybe uh, we look at all four because you want to make sure that it's the same trends that are being um, seen throughout all four indexes to kind of say, okay, well, we are having economic growth, but you know, um, you can't just look at one. Right. And again, these are the measurements or the indexes that are used to determine the overall economic performance. So it doesn't always need to be growth. It could be, you know, right. decline, but I know I began the discussion not really thinking these played a major role to the degree that I felt it should, but I can see after discussion how and why they may be important to important categories to look at and to consider and just to kind of you know summarize employment or unemployment so are you working do you have a job do you have income coming in on a monthly basis to not only you know you know pay your housing needs so that could be your home right can you drive a car to your employment do you have a car and are you able to spend at all after your major assets as an individual, you know, living here? I can still see how and why they're important to look at and to consider. However, I do want to conclude this with a couple of thoughts. I really believe when I look at these reports and kind of dive deep into the numbers, you mentioned earlier as well that very subjective numbers that we're holding all this weight on. And while I can see how each category is important and how it plays a role, I still believe that there's there has to be a better way to measure if our economy is really performing the way that we would like it to be performing. So, so if we're looking for growth, which you know we, we are usually looking for growth as an output, or there should be additional ways, whether that's diving deeper into each category to understand the nuances that are not really being revealed or highlighted in the numbers and the raw reports we get. Um, but I really believe that there needs to be some kind of update in either what we're measuring or how we're measuring these things because I do believe that these, this is like really an outdated model with how we're currently interpreting the data. While they're all important categories, it's not really indicative of true growth. 
um, I don't really feel that it's really a representation if our economy is positively increasing in a growth perspective. We may see growth here and there, or it may allude to the idea of growth, but it doesn't necessarily give us the accuracy that we would need to really say, if this is X, then this indicates growth. And that brings us to a close. I hope you've enjoyed today's segment and that you've found value or gained further insight by tuning in today. Please support me by sharing this clip with others. That's the only way I can grow and build my audience. And if you like my style, please be sure to check out the entire Edge series playlist. It's full of my best business content and so many people write in to me that they most appreciate the conciseness to my messages and they love, love, love the valuable takeaways that can be readily implemented. Follow me on social media and check out my YouTube channel. Links are in the description below.